the same instructions every day. Focus on your breath. Try to make the breath comfortable. Try to see what way of breathing feels good right now. Just right for the body, just right for the mind. Just right for the body means you're not adding any unnecessary tension. If the body feels tired, you breathe in a way that's energizing. If it feels tense, you breathe in a way that's relaxing. Just right for the mind means the kind of breathing that you can follow. Stay alert. And yet at the same time feel at ease. One of the traditional images in the forest tradition is that you're like a hunter. You're hunting insights. And any hunter has to be alert and still at the same time. That's the quality you're trying to develop in the mind. Still, so that you don't scare the animals away. Alert, so that you're alert to the signs that an animal is approaching. And you have to be very patient. You can't be sure that you'll have your rabbit by 4 p.m. in time for dinner. The rabbit could come at any time, so you have to be prepared at any time. Otherwise, if you doze off, the rabbit will pass right in front of you and you won't see it at all. If you're letting your mind think about something else, not alert to the signs that sounds that rabbits tend to make. You're going to miss a lot of the rabbits. It's the same with the mind. You can do the concentration. This is why we give those instructions. But the insights, though, there's no direct guarantee that if you focus in a certain way that the insights will have to come right away. But you do put your mind in a state where it's ready to notice them when they do come. Still enough so that areas of the mind that normally get sloughed past or become a blur because you're running around too much suddenly become clear. It's like running past a tree, or standing still and watching the tree. You see very different trees. If you run past, you see a blur, you may get a few details here and there. But there's a lot that you can't say if you were asked afterwards what was in the tree. You don't know. But if you stand still and look very carefully, you make up your mind that you're going to look for, say, the leaves, or you're going to look for the birds, or you're going to look for the squirrels. You begin to see the signs. So you have to be still, but you also have to be intent. You have to have a purpose. What this means is that the patience you develop in the path, which is aided by your concentration, aided by your ability to stay with the breath, with a sense of well-being, even when nothing else seems to be going on. has to have a purpose. You're here to see how the mind is creating unnecessary suffering for itself. So you're trying to learn how to look for the signs. And one of the signs is, as you get the mind still, where is there still a disturbance? How do you know the disturbance? Whether well, something goes up and down in the level of stress, either in the body or in the mind. When you notice an up and down like that, ask yourself, well, what did you do that created more stress? What did you do the instant that the stress went away? Is there a connection? So you have to have some focus, and you have to have a purpose. 
and that way your patience yields results. The same principle applies outside. If there are things you want to change in the environment around you, some changes you can do at any time at all. Other changes depend on the people around you, what moods they have, when they're ready to listen to you. And so as you're patient, it doesn't mean that you've given up, or it doesn't mean that you're lazy. You're simply waiting for the signs. There are some rules in, for the monks that if you have an issue with somebody, before you accuse them of misbehavior, you have to ask yourself, what is your motivation? How sure are you of what you saw or heard? And when you realize that your motivation is for the well-being of that other person, and you're sure of what you saw, then you approach the other person. In other words, you have to make sure that your motivation is right. I know one monk who said he had to work with his mind for five years before he could finally bring himself to talk to another monk in line with all the Buddhist prescriptions. And it worked. The other monk could sense the motivation behind the question, behind the accusation, and was very willing to change. Now, if the first monk hadn't waited, things might have blown up and nothing would have been accomplished. So having a sense of time means, one, being very, very patient, and two, learning how to look for the signs. They don't jump out at you. You have to look for them. It's like looking for certain kinds of mushrooms in the forest. One, you have to learn how to recognize them, because some of them look like little holes in the carpet of leaves. In other words, just spaces between the leaves. And secondly, you have to want the mushroom. So it's a matter of recognizing and wanting at the same time. The desire for things to change and the desire for things to be better than they are is nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to do away with. It's simply something you have to learn how to train. Remember the Buddha's image of the, the path. It's the continental shelf off of India. There's a gradual slope and then there's a sudden drop. Just like the continental shelf off the east coast of the United States. And the gradual slope is as you're getting more and more familiar with the territory. But it takes time and you have to be willing to take the time to get more and more sensitive. But the moment of sensitivity, when your sensitivity meets right up with the issue that you're looking for, what particular defilement is there in the mind, which of, which of the voices of the committee in the mind is running things without you realizing it. You have to keep in the back of your mind, this is what you're looking for. Otherwise the signs can go right past you. and you don't see anything, because they are going right past you all the time anyhow, simply getting the mind still enough to see them and also learning how to recognize them and wanting to see them, making that your focus. This is why the questions that we ask ourselves in the practice center on a few, very few topics. Where is the stress? What's causing it? And the Buddha gives you some idea of the terrain what kind of questions to ask. But you want to keep the focus narrow, otherwise you're looking for too many things all at once, and you end up not seeing any of them. I received a letter one time from a monk. He said he had 165 questions for me. He's going to be nice enough to let me answer them in little batches at a time. And I wrote back to him and said, I can't believe that anybody is, seriously has that many questions bothering him. What are the questions that really are alive for you? 
What are the important ones? We well, took umbrage, and that was the end of the conversation. He thought I was making fun of him. But the point was serious. If you're asking too many questions, want too many things, it's very unlikely that you're going to see the signs for it. when is the right time to want that thing to happen. Or what are the signs that that particular insight is about to come? So trying to narrow things down. What do you really want out of your meditation? The Buddha recommends that you ask yourself one big question. Is, what am I doing that's causing unnecessary stress and suffering? And the doing here may be very subtle things, like perceptions. We tend to think of reality that we see as a given. But you have to realize there's so much that's based on the labels you put on things. And the labels can be accurate for what they're worth, but they can actually be a problem. I mean, there's no label that's going to be 100% in line with the way things are. But the labels we create are good enough to get by. Good enough to get use out of the body, good enough to get use out of the mind. But they can have their drawbacks. For instance, with pain in the body. There may be a label in the mind that says, this pain has invaded my body. It has a certain shape, it has a certain color, it has a certain texture, it has a certain intention. Some of these things go under the radar, but the label is already there. But it has to be keep, you have to keep applying it again and again and again. So you want to catch the mind as it's applying those labels, because a lot of them are causing you trouble, totally unnecessarily. So look for the labels. That's one of the big issues. Looking at the teachings of the Forest of John, so that they keep coming back to this issue again and again and again, the issue of perception. The perception that adds unnecessary stress, unnecessary suffering. The perception by which you understand things, and the understanding that could be perfectly okay as far as daily life goes. When you're sitting here with just being trying to be aware of the body and the mind right now, the perception may be part of the problem, part of the stress that you're adding. So you want to get the mind still enough so you can see these things. And also give the mind a purpose. We're not here just to simply watch whatever comes and goes and be okay with that. We're here to see what is the mind doing that's creating the trouble. And every now and then it, these things will show themselves. If you're patient, you can stay with the breath with a sense of well-being. You're putting yourself in a position where you can see them. You can't guarantee that you'll see them today or tomorrow. That's the gradual part. As long as you've got yourself in the right place with the right intention and ask the right questions. Then there will come a point where things open up and you say, oh, it's been happening all along, and I half knew it, but I didn't really know it. And now I see it clearly. This is a problem, and I, I'm creating the problem, and I don't have to. At that point, you don't have to, you don't have to think about inconstancy, stress, or not self, or dependent core arising, or emptiness, or any of the, the big issues. You're focused on something you can see right here, right now. That's been right here, right now. You've been looking past it, but now you see. It. 
That's what this is all about. When you solve this problem, you find it's like pulling a thread out of a stocking. The whole weave begins to collapse. That's the sudden part of the path. So focus on being patient, but don't think that you're giving in by being patient. You're being wise. These things will show themselves when the conditions are right. And you're trying to refine the conditions bit by bit by bit. And there will come a point where, with just a slight action or a slight insight, things open up in a very unexpected way. That's when your patience pays off. You've got the rabbit. So don't tell yourself you don't want the rabbit, or don't pretend that you don't want the rabbit. There has to be a desire in the practice. It's simply a matter of learning how to focus your desires, paring them down, so you're not looking for too many things. And then just looking very carefully for the telltale signs. <laughs>